case anybody is wondering, I'm in my living room. This is the normal background I have in my living room. I'm calling to order this hearing. This is a public hearing of the uh, Committee of the Whole. Today is Tuesday, September 15th, 2020. The time is 9.09 .09 in the morning. Uh, this is a hearing of the Committee of the Whole that is being hosted on the Zoom uh, video broadcast platform. So it is being conducted virtually. The subject of this morning's hearing is consideration uh, or hearing testimony regarding 10 bills that are pending in the Committee of the Whole. And those bills are Bill 23-508 entitled the Elaine M. Carter Community Center Designation Act of 2019. This bill was introduced on October 22nd, 2019 by Council Members Treon White, Alyssa Silverman, David Grasso, and Vince Gray. The stated purpose of this bill is to designate the Douglas Community Center located at 1922 Frederick Douglas Court Southeast as the Elaine M. Carter Community Center. The second bill is Bill 23-532, entitled the Dr. Montague Cobb Way Designation Act of 2019. This legislation was introduced on November 5th, 2019 by Council Members Nadeau, Todd, McDuffie, Gray, Grasso, Bonds, Treon White, Robert White, Allen, and Shea. The stated purpose of this bill is to symbolically designate the 600 block of W Street Northwest as Dr. Montague Cobb Way. The third bill is Bill 23-538, entitled the Elaine M. Carter Way Designation Act 2019. This bill was introduced on November 5th, 2019 by Council Members Nadeau, Todd, McDuffie, Grasso, Che, Bonds, Trayon White, Robert White. I'm sorry, I'm just reading the wrong bill. Uh, let me start over. This bill, the Elaine M. Carter Way Designation Act of 2019, Bill 23-538 was introduced on November 5th, 2019 by Council Members Trayon White, uh, Mary Che, Jack Evans, and Alyssa Silverman. The stated purpose of this bill is to symbolically designate the Frederick Douglass Court Southeast in square 5880 as Elaine M. Carter Way. Uh, the next bill, which I started to read before, is Bill 23-533, the Lucy Diggs Slow Way Designation Act of 2019. This bill was also introduced on Tuesday, November 5th, 2019, by Council Members Nadeau, Todd, McDuffie, Grasso, Che, Bonds, Treon White, Robert White, and Vince Gray. And the stated bill, purpose of this bill is to symbolically designate the 2400 block of 4th Street Northwest as Lucy Diggs Slow Way. The next bill is Bill 23-609, entitled the Gail Cobb Way Designation Act of 2020. This bill was introduced on January 10th, 2020 by Councilmember Charles Allen. And the stated purpose of this bill is to symbolically designate the 300 block of 14th place Northeast as Gail Cobb Way. The next bill is Bill 23-619, to uh, which is entitled Lafayette Pointer Park and Lafayette Pointer Recreation Center designation after 2020. This bill was introduced on January 21st, 2020 by Councilmember Todd. The stated purpose of this bill is to designate Lafayette Park, which is located at 5900 33rd Street and Quesada Street Northwest as the Lafayette Pointer Park and designates the Lafayette Recreation Center as the Lafayette Pointer Recreation Center. The next bill is Bill 23-680 which is entitled the Cecilia's Way Designation Act of 2020. This bill was introduced on February 27th, 2020 by Council Members Allen and Nadeau. <clears throat> the stated purpose of this bill is to symbolically designate Wiltberger Street Northwest 
between S Street and T Street Northwest and Cecilia's Way. The next bill is Bill 23-787, which is entitled the Black Lives Matter Plaza Designation Act of 2020. This legislation was introduced on Monday, June 15, 2020 by council members Grasso, Robert White, Che, Allen, McDuffie, Bond, Silverman, Nadeau, Todd, Gray, and myself. The stated purpose of this bill is to symbolically designate 16th Street between 8th Street and K Street Northwest as Black Lives Matter Plaza. I'll note that this has already been designated as Black Lives Matter Plaza uh, symbolically through emergency and temporary legislation, but this bill would be the permanent version. The next bill is Bill 23-839, which is entitled Earl Wright Way, Earl Wright Jr. Way Designation Act of 2020. Uh, this legislation was introduced on July 8th, 2020 by Councilmember Todd. And the stated purpose of this bill is to symbolically designate the 3800 block of 10th Street Northwest between Quincy, Randolph, and 10th Streets Northwest as Earl Wright Jr. Way. And the next bill, which I believe is the final bill of this packet, I haven't been counting, but I think this is number 10, is Bill 23-840, which is entitled the Ronald Ron Austin Memorial Park Designation Act of 2020. This bill was introduced on July 8th, 2020 by Councilmember Todd. The stated purpose of this bill is to designate the park located on the 6100 block of North Dakota Avenue, bounded by Quackenbos Street and 2nd Street Northwest as the Ronald Ron Austin Memorial Park. For streets and alleys, the symbolic naming is for ceremonial purposes and shall be in addition to and subordinate to any name that is an official name. An official designation typically involves the designation of postal addresses and enables the placement of the primary entrance to residences or offices on the street or alley. Public spaces other than a street or alley, such as parks or buildings, may also be symbolically or officially named. Uh, the notice for this hearing was, uh, I believe, posted at the very end of July. And so we have witnesses who have signed up to testify and the only way to testify is to have registered. However, anyone who wishes to submit testimony is encouraged to do so and uh, can do so by sending their testimony to the Committee of the Whole. Uh, written statements would be submitted to the Committee of the Whole either at 1350 Pennsylvania Avenue or by email at, I believe it's cow at dccouncil.us. The record in this matter with regard to all of these bills will close in two weeks, that is at five o'clock p.m. on September 29th, 2020. Uh, I believe there are two council members who are on at this hearing and they are council members Treon White and Brooke Pinto. Let me see if council member White has an opening statement and I'll turn to council member Pinto. Council member White. Yes, Chairman, good morning. Good morning. Good morning, uh, Ms. Pinto as well, Councilman Pinto. Um, before I start, Chairman, I do want to note I submitted something for Harold Foster Way as well. Um, I was hoping to get that on the agenda today as well. Um, but while you're checking into that, I'll keep going. Good morning, Chairman Menderson, Council Members, staff, and viewing audience. Thank you uh, for holding this hearing. Uh, that focuses on remembering residents who profoundly impacted DC and should be recognized by their hard work. Several bills will be discussed today, but I will focus on my comments with just two. Uh, first, the Elaine M. Carter Community Center Designation Act of 2019 um, and the Elaine Carter Way Designation Act of 2019. Ms. Elaine Carter Moore, affection on this Ms. E, was a vibrant, steadfast uh, Washingtonian who resided in Ward 8 community. Many people refer to Ms. E as the superwoman of Ward 8. This is one of the reasons I introduced the legislation to rename Douglas Community Center in her honor as her ceremonial renaming Fred Douglas Court, located in Square 5880. 
in Ward 8 as the Elaine M. Carter Way. Mrs. E deserves these honors and more. She devoted her, her life to helping the community by working as a community activist, political organizer, former president of the Resident Council of Stanton Dwellings, and volunteer uh, in so many different capacities. There was no problem or person she was not willing to lend a hand to help. Mrs. E worked to ensure that those who live east Anacostia River and across the river got a fair shot at services. She fed the underprivileged every Wednesday morning at 7 o'clock a.m., and not just for, uh, for in public housing, but all water residents. Her mentorship, advocacy, and wisdom has left an incredible impact on those who she met along the way. Renaming the Douglas Community Center and ceremony renaming the street in her honor will serve as a constant reminder to those in the community that you have to give back and return to your roots, and the community should be better because you live there or live there. The council has a lot of work before us. The council would also have hard decisions to make, but today we can hear from residents who have worked hard to make DC a prominent place to live today. Uh, thank you, Chairman. Oh, thank you, Councilmember White. And if you would submit a copy of that statement to us, uh, we can include, include that with the legislation. That would be helpful. Will do. Uh, Councilmember Pinto, do you have an opening statement? Sure. Thank you so much, Chairman Mendelson, and congratulations to the families and all of the wonderful people who are commemorating with these designations in our city today. I just want to speak for a moment about Black Lives Matter Plaza located in Ward 2 to honor and commemorate the summer's widespread call for criminal justice reforms and racial equity the council is moving forward with the ceremonial naming of Black Lives Matter Plaza. And this has been a gathering place for a unique call to action for governments at every level and citizens to challenge ourselves to come together and work to root out our systemic racism. And here in the district and throughout the country, we must ensure that every resident, no matter the color of their skin, is treated with dignity and respect and has an equal opportunity to succeed in today's society. And while commemoration is important, I think we all know that it is not a sufficient step in and of itself. And contributing to this effort is the District of Columbia's Police Reform Commission, which will continue to examine police practices in the district and provide evidence-based recommendations for the reforming and revisioning of these practices. I've been following along the commission's progress and look forward to receiving their recommendations in December. And as our protests continue throughout the city, let us all please remember to treat one another with respect and be mindful that any outliers of non-peaceful activity will not be tolerated. And let us also rem remember that BLM Plaza continues to be home to residents, small businesses, hotels, and restaurants. Let's demonstrate that we can and will call for change in a peaceful and respectful way. And let's not allow the distracting talking points of chaos to undermine our larger goal of justice. Thank you so much, Chairman. Uh, thank you, Councilmember Pinto. And if you would provide us a copy of the statement, we can include that in the record as well. Sure. Uh, Councilmember White, uh, we checked, and the only measure, legislative measure that uh, we see on the um, Legislative Information Management System, LIMS, is a ceremonial res resolution for Harold Foster, and that has already been approved. Is there something else that uh, we're not seeing? I'll get my staff to check and follow up with you uh, after we finish this process, but it's supposed to be a ceremony street name. Okay, please follow up with your staff because we're not seeing it in limbs. All right. Uh, thank you. Uh, so let me turn now to each of the bills in turn. Uh, the bills are in uh, numerical order. So we start with 508 and end with 840. Uh, our process is that uh, we will call witnesses who've registered to testify on each bill, and then at the end of the hearing, we will recognize or have testimony from uh, government witnesses. There are two government witnesses. Uh, so the first bill is 23-508, Elaine M. Carter Community Center Designation Act of 2019. I'm told that Lakeisha Gaden contacted us today to testify. Uh, if she is here, if she could... Uh, proceed. Okay. 
Ms. Gaden, would you proceed? And I believe we have folks uh, limited to three minute testimony. Good morning, can you all hear me? Yes, and good morning. Oh, good morning. Good morning, council and every all participants. My name is Lakeisha Gaten and I'm speaking on behalf of the Carter family. In reference to both bills, this statement is for both. Um, I will start. On behalf of my family, I am eager to let everyone know that my mother, Elaine Carter, is worthy of recognized. My siblings and I shared our mother with the community. My mother gave to all who needed help and to those she thought needed help. There were times when she took food from our refrigerator to help someone. We all thought she shouldn't have and spoke to her about it. Her answer always was, God will bless me for this and shut up. There was a time when a young lady came to the house crying, asking for help because her baby had died from SID, from SID. And she didn't have the money to bury her and that she didn't, and she did not want to burn her baby, cremate. My mother prayed with her and told her that that was not going to happen. She made calls for don donations and went to every door in our community and she gave up her entire disability check to help this mother. Everything worked out fine and the baby had a funeral. She even created a diversion center in the community where the children came to do their home. had to move stress them not to sign anything and not to move unless they all had the opportunity to come back. All signed and moved. She was the last man standing for the community. She was living in a community by herself with the dwellings boarded and fenced in. She remained living there for weeks. Her strategy worked because thanks to her, families were able to return if they wanted to. My mother, Elaine Carter, helped all who came to her door for help, either for elections as well as just needing to talk. The housing department knew her well. She was often down there fighting for a neighbor or her community. There are so many things she had done that I haven't mentioned. I just want to say she's truly worthy of this honor, of these honors, and thank you. Thank you, and that's the end of the family statement. Thank you, Ms. Gaden. It's very helpful that you're here and that you gave this statement. Uh, it would be enormously appreciated if you would get us a copy of your statement. Um, sure. I have to say that the internet connection faltered a little, so we didn't hear everything you said, which makes it even more important that we get a, a copy, which you can send to us by email. Sure. COW at dccouncil.us. I will do that. Thank you very much. Um, don't go anywhere yet. Um, the, um, I do want to ask you a question, and that is, there are two measures, and uh, usually we only adopt one. One would be to um, designate the uh, Douglas Center, and the other would be to, uh, that would be an official designation, I believe, and the other would be to ceremonially designate Frederick Douglass Court. Does, do you or the family have a preference? I am sure the family have a preference, but I don't want to make that call. Is it possible that I can contact them and by the end of the meeting let you all know? Oh, absolutely. Thanks. Uh, so let me turn to my colleagues and ask them if they have any questions. Councilmember White, do you have any questions? No, I do not. Thank you for testifying. You're welcome. Councilmember Council Pinto, do you have any questions? Councilmember Pinto? I don't think so. No, she... I don't have any questions. Thank you, Chairman. Okay, thank you. Let me just check with my staff real quickly. Uh, thank you, Councilmember. Um, and thank you, Ms. Gaden. Uh, you're going to be excused. In, um, Please get back to us with regard to the two things, the statement as well as the answer to that question I had posed. And um, with that, uh, you're excused, Ms. Gaden.
And we're going to recognize witnesses regarding um, Bill 23-532. Uh, I should say something about the process that we're following, which I apparently didn't say earlier, and that is that um, individuals will be led into the interview portion of the, or excuse me, the interactive portion of the hearing by staff as their panel comes up. So I'm assuming there are a number of folks who are attending. I see that they're 30, uh, but they cannot all, um, they're not all panelists. Uh, but uh, as I call the bill, we will let people in to be panelists, and they are Dr. Fatima Jackson, uh, Dr. Dana Williams, and Suzanne Bathgate. Uh, Dr. Jackson is director of the W. Montague Cobb Research Laboratory at Howard University. Dr. Williams is interim dean at Howard University Graduate School. And Ms. Uh, Dr. Bathgate is chair of the board of directors of the Medical Society of DC. If they're all in, um, let me, I'm going to ask each of you to testify in turn, and then I'll turn to colleagues for questions. Uh, Dr. Jackson, do you want to begin? And good morning. Yes, good morning, sir, and good morning, everyone. Um, yes, I'd like to, I'm, I'm Dr. Fatima Jackson, and I'm a professor at Howard University. Um, Dr. William Montagu Cobb was at my mentor and was a Washington native. He graduated from Dunbar High School in 1921. And after earning his bachelor's degree from Amherst College, he earned his me medical degree from Howard University. And he did this while continuing to work through medical school. As a board certified physician and biological anthropologist, he was the first African American to earn a PhD in anthropology and the only one until after the Korean War. Now Cobb's focus was in anatomically studying the idea of race and its negative impact on communities of color. And to address these issues, Dr. Cobb assembled the Cobb Collection, which is the largest collection of African-American skeletal and dental remains um, in the United States, excuse me, in the world, and the third largest human skeletal collection in the United States. Now, Dr. Cobb's work was recognized nationally and internationally. And at Howard University, Cobb became the university's first distinguished professor in 1969, and he became professor emeritus in 1973. Indeed, Cobb was an outstanding Howard University faculty member and Washington DC community member. His visionary insights spanned a large and diverse array of disciplines. He was an activist scholar. He lobbied for the medical rights of African-American physicians. He challenged the racism and bias in Washington DC and the nation. And he translated medical and scientific innovations into advances that worked for the community and public health good. As a physician, scholar, and professor at Howard University, and an advocate for human rights and Washington DC community activist, Cobb was dedicated to the advancement of African Americans. Cobb was heavily involved in civil rights activism, regularly interacted with US presidents and congressional representatives. Cobb wrote prolifically and contributed to both popular and scholarly articles during his career. His work has been noted as a significant contribution to the development of the subdiscipline of biocultural anthropology during the first half of the 20th century. Now Cobb was an accomplished educator and he taught thousands of students during his academic lifetime. Of equal importance, Cobb served as a mentor to the thousands of scholars, including myself, who have tried to emulate his interdisciplinary focus, integrative approach, and intellectual excellence. So it's extremely important that we have a visible reminder of um, Cobb's efforts and his approach, because it's, it's, uh, the street name would be a reminder of the importance of his scholarship, his activism, and his uh, curiosity and intellectual excellence. And we hope that that marker will serve as a visual reminder of the best that Washington DC can produce. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Jackson. Um, Dr. Williams. Good morning, everyone. And thank you for the opportunity to testify on behalf of this bill. 
Um, I am pleased to join my colleagues here um, to speak briefly on the significance of Dr. William Montague Cobb. A Washington DC native, Dr. Cobb helped develop the emerging discipline of physical anthropology, a field of study that focuses on human evolutionary biology and physical variation. As Dr. Jackson has mentioned, Dr. Cobb taught at Howard for more than 60 years and from there earned the status of one of the most influential scholars of physical anatomy, among other fields. He was the author of no fewer than 1,100 articles on physical anatomy topics and issues related to African-American health. In an article titled Race and Runners, Dr. Cobb refuted the notion that Jesse Owens' success in the Olympics as an athlete was related to the innate physical prowess of African-Americans and innate ability that scientists then claimed corresponded with decreased intelligence. Mm -hmm. Dr. Cobb sought to prove that Owens' ability, for example, was not due to his race, but to his training and his ability to use his critical thinking skills to succeed as an athlete and as a human, really. Of particular relevance today is Dr. Cobb's tendency to apply science to social issues. He argued more than 50 years ago that racism harms African-American health and thereby impacts all of American society adversely. Of note too is Dr. Cobb's provision of expert testimony as Dr. Jackson mentioned to Congress on healthcare legislation culminating in the passage of the Medicare Act of 1965. Accordingly, I am pleased to support a bill to de designate the William Montague Cobb way, especially in this moment where African-Americans and people of color are disproportionately impacted by health issues in the DC and area and beyond. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Williams. Dr. Bathgate. Good morning. Thank you, Chairman and, and Council members for the opportunity to testify today. Um, during the day, I'm a maternal fetal medicine specialist at George Washington University School of uh, Medicine and Health Sciences and associate professor there in the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology. Outside of my work capacity and the capacity I'm testifying today, I am the chair of the board of directors of the Medical Society of the District of Columbia, MSDC. MSDC supports the efforts to symbolically name the 600 block of W Street, Dr. Montague Cobb Way. Others will list the numerous reasons why Dr. Cobb is worthy of this honorific, but I wanted to highlight a few important ones from a medical perspective. By his own estimates, Dr. Cobb trained 6,000 health professionals at Howard University. His work in anthropology plus medicine showed that black and white children's brains developed in the same way, dispelling, dispelling a horrible myth that black children were intellectually inferior by birth. He was a leader in the National Medical Association and the Medico Chirurgical Society of DC, MedCi DC. And he was a child of the district born here and educated at Dunbar High. The district's medical history is incredibly rich and is underrepresented in honorifics in the city. For instance, Dr. Charles Drew, pioneer of effective blood transfusion and blood banks, was a district native. The American Medical Association itself was founded with the assistance of district physicians, three of whom served as presidents of the association. MSDC urges the district government to include physicians and medical professions, professionals in the lists of native Washingtonians to recognize throughout the city in new ways. We especially urge the council and Bowser administration to consult with our MedCi colleagues to ensure that the history of black medicine in the district is appropriately recognized. I welcome any questions that you may have or you may contact the MSDC office at 202-466-1800 or hey at msdc.org for follow-up questions. I thank you for the opportunity and urge you to pass this bill. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Bathgate. Thank you, each of you, for your testimony. Dr. Bathgate, we have a copy of your statement. Uh, Dr. Williams and Dr. Jackson, I don't believe we have copies of your statement, and I really urge that uh, you get it to us, um, which you can do by email so that we can include it in the record. Uh, I do not have any other questions for you. I don't see that there's any issue with our approving this bill, but we'll see what the government says at the end, which I think is favorable. Uh, let me turn to my colleagues. Um, da, uh, Council Member uh, Tran White, if you're still on the call, or uh, Council Member Pinto. Uh, maybe that they both have uh, left. I do not have any questions for you, so I appreciate your testimony. It's helpful, and thank you. And with that, you're excused, and we're going to turn to the next bill, which is Bill 23-533.
Lucy Diggs Slowway Designation Act of 2019. Um, we have two witnesses, Dr. Dana Williams and Dr. Amy Yoba. And I apologize for mispronouncing that. Uh, Dr. Dana Williams, who just testified and will be testifying again, if that's why I'm still seeing you. Um, in addition to being the um, interim dean at Howard University Graduate School, is the Lucy Diggs Slow Society an interim dean, which I already said. So, and then Dr. Yo Yoba, am I mispronouncing that? Yoba. Yoba? Yes. I'll try. Um, Associate Professor of Africana Studies at Howard University, Department of Afro-American Studies. So why don't you begin, uh, Dr. Williams? Thank you again, Chairman, and thank you all again for the opportunity to talk about the significance of Lucy Diggs Slow. Again, my name is Dana Williams. I am Interim Dean of the Graduate School at Howard University, a member of the Lucy Diggs Slow Society and a member of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. Lucy Diggs Slow was trailblazer in so many ways. She was one of the original founders of Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, the first sorority founded by African-American women in 1908 at Howard University. In 1917, she became the first African-American woman to win a major sports title as the champion for the American Tennis Association's first tournament in Baltimore, Maryland. In 1919, she created the first junior high school in Washington, D.C., and was appointed its principal, a position she held until 1922 when she was appointed the first dean of women at Howard University. She also created and led two professional associations, the National Association of College Women and the Association of Advisors to Women in Colored Schools. I could certainly use the full time that I have here available to talk about the significance of the organizations and the institutions of which uh, Lucy Diggs Slow was critical in terms of being a founder and a member. I will cede that time, however, to Dr. Yabois, who is herself a Lucy Diggs scholar. So I'm grateful now to um, support this bill and cannot overemphasize the significance of a, a, an appropriate designation of Lucy Diggs Slow Way. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Thank you, Dr. Williams. Um, and Dr. Yobwa? Yes. Good morning, um, Chairman and Council and Committee members, staff and public viewers. My name is Dr. Amy Yobwa. I'm an Associate Professor in the Department of Afro American Studies at Howard University. And I'm also working on a forthcoming book on Lucy Dick Slow. In alignment with our university president who sent in a testimony, the Howard University Student Association president who also sent a testimony, and Dean Cruz, the Dean of the School of Social Work who also sent a testimony. I also support the Lucy Diggs Low Society petition, the Lucy Diggs Low Way. I first learned about Lucy Diggs Low because of her title as Dean of Women at Power University, co-founder of Alpha Cop Alpha Sword Incorporated, and her name used to be on a building of a dorm on Third Street in DC. I knew about her resume, I knew about her employers, her start and end date, but before I did this work, I didn't know much about her. I didn't know the pressure she felt in being a role model for all women, for a group of international women, a community of women who shared a vision she started in her dorm room with her friends. Slow poured her heart out and soul into moving from Baltimore to DC to become a teacher at the DC Armstrong Manual Teaching High School. I didn't know what guided her to become the principal at the nation's capital's first junior high school. Slow carefully selected every teacher, staff, curriculum, activity, and she made it her personal goal to know every student and their families, just like Dean Williams said. But also didn't know how much work and how little pay she put into coming to Howard to be the Dean of Women, how that impacted her life up into her death, and how she dedicated all her work to create a pathway for women in higher education. Even as an educator, educator she's extremely motivated to not only address the issues that were dealing with her students at Howard, but she was also motivated to address the social issues that plagued Black families in supporting the creation of the School of Social Work at Howard University and becoming board members to many DC organizations, such as the YWCA, Associated Charities, and the National Youth Administration. I didn't know that she was asked to be a college pastor, 
joined the Fifth African Congress and was invited frequently to the White House to talk about issues that dealt with African Americans. With the designation of Lucy Dick Slowway, Lucy's legacy to Washington, D.C., the children, families, teachers, students, and women will be widely known. Looking at that sign, Howard University students, Howard Middle School students, D.C. residents and visitors all will begin to get to know her and her story will be told. For plenty of time, she walked along that same street on Gresham Place, going back home to Brooklyn. And she thought about a better community, a better DC, a better society. So I encourage all of us to support the Lucy Dixo Society petition and return this immeasurable gesture of hard work Lucy Dixo poured not into just DC, but into the nation in designating Lucy Dixo way. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and I apologize for struggling over your name because I think trying to pronounce somebody's name is important as a show of respect. So I apologize for that. Uh, it, it would be helpful to the committee if we have your written statements. Uh, we did receive some other materials, including from um, Dr. Frederick, who, as you know, is the president of Howard, and there was a petition. Uh, but your statements would be helpful as well. Mm -hmm. Um, I think one of you said that there used to be a dorm named after her. Could you say more about that? So, um, Howard's campus on Third Street in Ward 1, there used to be a dorm named after Lucy Dixlow. It was two years ago, um, it was resold and now becoming private property. So it used to be a college dorm. It was given to Howard University by the government um, at the time. So Howard students used to live in that dorm named after her. And so because it's transferred to the private sector, it's lost its name. It's, well, it's lost its dorm affiliation. I think right now it's being named just a slow, but at some point the name was taken away from it altogether. It wasn't called something else. But I believe community members came together um, and positioned that at least part of her name um, be associated with the building. Um, but we would like her full name and her full legacy to be not just associated with the building and the street, but also um, the historical fabric of DC, all to remember. Yes. Uh, all right. Uh, thank you. Uh, I I see that Councilmember Charles Allen has joined us. My guess is regarding a different bill, but I'll recognize him if you have any questions on this bill, Councilmember Allen. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I know I just logged in. Um, I did want to be able to speak just to two. I know you, you have multiple measures today, so there were two in particular in Ward Six that I wanted to be able to speak to. Uh, so I don't have any questions about this specifically, but whenever the, t whenever the moment's right, I'd like to just make a, a statement about the two that are in Ward 6. Uh, why don't we give it a minute and then I'll recognize you. Perfectly fine. Thank you very much. All right. So the witnesses regarding Lucy did slow. Um, you're excused. Thank you for your testimony. Again, give us copies of your written statements. Uh, the next bill is Bill 23-538, entitled the Elaine M. Carter Way Designation Act of 2019. I think we covered that with the testimony regarding Bill 23-508 uh, concerning Elaine Carter and the Community Center. Um, and there were no other witnesses who signed up for that. The next bill is Bill 23-609, the Gail Cobb Way Designation Act of 2020. Um, there were no witnesses who signed up for this bill. It was introduced uh, by Councilmember Allen. Let me recognize him now. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I'm glad I was able to log in just in time for, for this. This is certainly, uh, and I'm going to speak to, while well, I talk to Gail Cobway, um, also speak to one other uh, Ward 6 uh, renaming as well, if I can, uh, just so sure. that I can be incorporated. Um, I, I want to Thank you for holding this hearing. I also want to thank all the public witnesses who are testifying today because there's a lot of namings taking place. Um, and I wanted to speak in particular about two of them. One is Gail Cobway, which is what you're about to reference, uh, which is Bill 23-609. And I also want to make comments on Cecilia's Way, which is Bill 23-680, both of which I introduced. Um, briefly, let me talk about uh, Gail Cobway. Um, and let me step back to just for a second general. Uh, we certainly are having a conversation in our city right now about um, historical namings. We're um, appropriately trying to, as a city, look at 
the names that were chosen, uh, more often than not, by the people that are sitting all here now, um, and who they represent and, and who they honor and, and in what ways they reflect our values in our city. And I think it's appropriate that in that context, we're actually talking about a, a, a number of public namings. Um, because I think this, this represents who we are and, and the values that we embrace and, and the names and the, um, the memories and the sacrifices that we want to lift up. So, um, you know, Gail Cobb way in, is, is in that vein. Um, Gail Cobb was uh, a neighbor uh, in the district, uh, a neighbor in Ward 6. Her parents still live in Ward 6 right off of D Street Northeast. And um, Gail Cobb was, uh, it's important that we recognize her and her family sacrifice. Um, Gail Cobb was the first female police officer killed in line of duty uh, in the District of Columbia. Um, it was many years ago, um, but it was important um, that this happens. It was uh, in 1974 uh, while she was on duty. Um, she was actually, I believe, the first female police officer killed in line of duty, not just in the district, but actually in the nation. Uh, her family has been at 1421 D Street Northeast for a very long time. Um, and when I talked with the family, they, you know, they wanted to find a way to honor their daughter's memory. Uh, and they worked with neighbors, they talked with neighbors in the ANC to, to get the support for the renaming of the 14th place uh, block, which is essentially, they live at the corner of D and 14th place. Um, and so it's, it's appropriate. I think that uh, it's fully supported by the community and by the ANC. Uh, I think it's a very uh, important way that we can honor uh, a life that was lost and the sacrifice that was given. But, um, but again, in the context of where we are today and, and the renamings that we're having, I think it's important. Um, I do want to briefly mention also, uh, as I mentioned, Cecilia Way. This is uh, introduced by myself uh, and I believe uh, Councilmember Brian Nadeau because this block, it's in Ward 6, but it runs right up against the border of Ward 1. Um, Cecilia, 1953, she opened uh, Cecilia's uh, on 2002 12th Street Northwest, and in 1958, she purchased the building. Um, it's essentially right next to, um, uh, it's at the corner of where, uh, where Wiltberger and Florida all come together. And um, this was, uh, she was the, the founder of Banneker Plaza Inc. Hospitality House. Uh, she uh, was a leader with CRM Development, the first African-American woman-owned real estate development company in the district. Um, I've heard many, many stories uh, about the relationship with the Howard Theater um, and the, the stage door, which is what it was previously named at 16, 618 T Street, um, and then it was renamed Cecilia's. And so when we look at ways to, to use our public spaces for namings, uh, be it full designations or ceremonial, um, I think it's an important way that we are trying to reflect our city's history, uh, our city's uh, diversity, and also embrace those values in the ways that will uh, certainly outlast us as these namings continue. So, uh, Mr. Chairman, I, both of the ones that I wanted to speak to have full support from the ANC and from the community. Uh, they've gone through their proper processes, and I know um, that uh, the, the testimony that we'll hear today is in, in support of those. And I just wanna make sure that I came in and, and while I can't be here for the whole hearing, I wanna make sure I stopped in to, to register my support for this, for these two specifically, but really more broadly that um, I think it's uh, very appropriate that you're holding this hearing and I'm grateful that you're doing this to be able to, to kind of cast the way in which we name our public spaces and our public ways uh, in this moment in a much more appropriate way than I think has been done uh, perhaps decades ago uh, that predate uh, this council. But thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I appreciate it. Thank you, Councilmember Allen. Um, if you have a copy of your statement or when you introduce these bills, if you could give us copies of your statements then, I think that would be helpful to us so that we have more material for the committee reports. I'd be happy to follow up with you and your team. Absolutely. <laughs> thank you. And even though that was an opening statement, I have no questions for you. <clears throat> And we had no other witnesses for Gail Cobway. So the next bill is Lafayette Pointer Park. And that will be followed by, excuse me, <clears throat> by Cecilia's way. So Bill 23-619, a Lafayette Pointer Park and Lafayette Pointer Recreation Center Designation Act of 2020. Uh, I'm gonna ask that we let all the witnesses in. And uh, we have, um, Carl Lankowski, who's president of the historic Chevy Chase DC, James Fisher, eighth generation descendant of Captain George Pointer, Commissioner Randy Speck with ANC 34G, 
Uh, I'm told that instead of Barbara Torrey, we're going to have Tiggy Green, um, whom I'm guessing is a co-author of the book Between Freedom and Equality, The History of an African-American Family in the District of Columbia, Penelope Mason, and Marley McKay, both of whom are sixth graders at Alice Deal Middle School. So if they're all in, uh, let's hear from them, uh, beginning with Mr. Lankowski. Uh, Chairman Mendelson, I'm honored to offer this testimony advocating redesignation of Lafayette Park and Recreation Center as Lafayette Pointer Park and Recreation Center. This reflects the will of the citizens and residents of Chevy Chase, D.C. to work through the history of their neighborhood and acknowledge the injustice done to our African-American neighbors nine decades ago when they were removed in order to construct a whites-only school. Thank you and your staff for scheduling this hearing. Thanks also to Councilmember Todd and his staff for their early recognition of significance of the initiative to add the name of Captain George Pointer to the center of gravity of a good part of Chevy Chase, DC. There are several other indi uh, individuals to thank for their tireless efforts in bringing us to this hearing. They are acknowledged in the written statement I have submitted to this committee. In attaching uh, George Pointer's name to the Park and Recreation Center, we are bearing witness to the entire arc of, your, of American history. The gesture is intended as an invitation for us to begin again in grasping what it has meant and should mean to lay claim to an American identity. Lafayette Pointer is a story of amnesia and reawakening. Chevy Chase was created at the height of Jim Crow as a white enclave. The Pointer descendants shared the fate of other non-white neighbors. The 1940 census shows that within a single generation, the only vestiges of the neighborhood's African-American population were the domestic servants in single family residences and the custodial staff in Connecticut Avenue apartment houses. George Pointer, born into slavery in 1773, purchased his freedom while working for George Washington in building the precursor of the CNO Canal. Pointer's granddaughter, Mary Harris, settled on Broad Branch Road in the, in the 1840s. Two of her sons fought with the Union Army and were wounded in the Civil War. The Pointer family dispossession came in 1928, when the burgeoning Chevy Chase neighborhood outgrew its first all-white elementary school. The Pointer descendants' land was conveniently chosen for the new school project. Therefore, for our neighborhood, the act you are considering today is more than a redesignation. It represents a rededication. With the signage we hope the city will contribute, we can begin again to understand and act on the requirements of neighborliness embodied in faith statements and in our nation's founding declaration. Some may claim that changing the name of a park accomplishes nothing, but I and my colleagues of historic Chevy Chase DC are convinced that change begins with awareness. Lafayette Pointer will be a constant reminder that something of note happened on these grounds a deliberate act of invidious discrimination that immediately impacted the Harris and Moton families and other Pointer descendants, but also compromised the broader community. More than a matter of expiation, we hope that this act will contribute to a new resolve to reimagine our city and the role of our neighborhood in it. Mr. Chairman, thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Lankowski. Uh, Mr. Fisher. I'm sorry, technical difficulty on my end. Good morning. Good morning. My name is James Fisher and I'm, a, I'm a, an eighth generation descendant of, of the Porter family. My third great grandmother, Mary Ann Plummer Harris, granddaughter of Captain George Pointer, purchased two and a half acres of land on a property now known as Lafayette Park and School. Although the patriot of the family, he had been born 
a slave in 1773. George Porner saved money he earned as a slave working for George, uh, George Washington's Potomac Company and purchased his freedom at age 19 with six years of savings. Pony was extremely value, valued worker in ending his career as superintendent engineer and the first African-American and ex-slave to hold such a position in a white company. Mary Harris, his granddaughter, benefited from her grandfather's discipline, wisdom, and possibly financial support with purchasing the property. They lived on the property for almost 80 years, subdividing the property to accommodate the needs of her family and several generations of extended family. What they created was more family village than a farm and they thrived there. In 1928, the family was evicted from their home due to decision to build a school on Broad Branch Road for expanding white communities. They had no choice in the matter and the family scattered across Washington, D.C. This uprooting destroyed, my, this destroyed the family support system that had been nurtured for over 80 years. My family never recovered. Renaming, renaming the park and rec center Lafayette Porner Park will rightfully plant a seed of historical truth for the unknowing current and future residents of Terry Chase Center. I've been approached by some residents in Terry Chase community puzzled asking why didn't they know a black family lived on the parkland. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Mr. Fisher. Uh, Commissioner or Chair uh, Randy Speck. Uh, thank you, Chair Middleson and council members for this opportunity to support Lafayette Pointer Park and Lafayette Pointer Recreation Center Designation Act of 2020. I'm Randy Speck, I'm chair of ANC 34G and I submit this testimony on behalf of the commission, which approved unanimously the attached resolution to my testimony supporting this bill in July uh, 2019. This recognition of the black heritage in our neighborhood is long overdue. There were thriving black communities along Broad Branch Road and in Reno City well into the 20th century, but they were displaced to make way for schools and parks that would serve the remaining overwhelmingly white community. Consequently, most residents today are oblivious to this history and its consequences. One step will be to change the name of this prominent park to honor Captain Pointer and his descendants. Our ANC also recently asked the National Park Service to remove the name of the racist Francis Newlands from the fountain at Chevy Chase Circle as one step to renounce past injustices. According, uh, acknowledging that more needs to be done than simply name changes, the ANC created a task force on racism to address the broader issues of racial bias as it affects education, health, housing, and our community. The name change for Lafayette Pointer Park and Lafayette Pointer Recreation Center should be an occasion for education. There are currently no funds available for signage to contextualize the story of the Pointer family and the racial history of this neighborhood. Such signage would provide an opportunity to inform current residents of past inequities and inspire them to make changes. We urge the council to separately fund explanatory signage that can describe the importance of this name change. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Commissioner. And your testimony was on behalf of the ANC. That is correct. Uh, Ms. Green? Yes, I'm here. Please proceed. Can you hear me? 
Yes. Yeah. Um, yes. I'm here with Barbara Tori. Okay. We're the co-authors of an upcoming book. And we are grateful for this opportunity to testify in favor of this bill. And uh, we've submitted a statement, but um, I'm going to ask Barbara to read that for, for you. We actually uh, uh, strong, strongly support uh, this bill. Everybody has gone through much of what uh, the, the history is. I think the one thing we could add is that there's a, um, a, a real synergy between adding uh, George Winner's name to uh, Lafayette's name. They were both men living at the same time. Lafayette actually was a strong abolitionist. And, and as other people have said, George Queener was a, um, uh, had been born a slave, bought his freedom, um, worked all of his life on the Potomac Canal and became actually um, a supervisory engineer at the end of his career, long after George Washington had died. Therefore, the two names actually are um, supportive of each other and, and uh, historically. Anyway, we've submitted our um, testimony and we'd be glad to answer any questions. Uh, thank you, Ms. Green. Um, I don't believe we have a copy of your statement, so that would be helpful. And is the book, uh, Between Freedom and Equality, The History okay. of the American Family, is that about uh, George Pointer? The book, the book is going to be published um, uh, next spring by Georgetown University Press. Um, and it's, it will detail all eight generations of uh, George Pointer's descendants. Okay, interesting. And um, are the uh, eight generations were are they all around the District of Columbia or scattered throughout the country? Um, you know, we, we were able to follow a, a fair number are still here in the um, uh, Washington area. James Fisher and his partner, Tanya Hardy, um, actually had a reunion, their first reunion after they read some of our research. And so we know that a, a fair number are, are still in the D.C. area. The reunion was held at Lafayette Park, yes. Interesting. Mr. Fisher, do you want to add to that? Um, about upward, upward of 80% uh, of George Pointer ancestors still remained in the DMV area. Interesting. When was the reunion? That was in 2015. Uh, interesting. Um, I uh, cut myself short, and that's very bad. Uh, uh, Penelope Mason. Uh, hi. Um, Hello. I, uh, so uh, I'll start. Mm -hmm. I'm a kid who cares about equality. Lafayette Elementary, my former school, was built on land taken from black landowners in order to make an all white neighborhood. I'm here to ask for you to rename Lafayette Park, Lafayette Pointer Park, in honor of Mary Harris and Mary Moten, who were George Pointer's grandchild, grandchild and great grandchild. I also ask to put up a historic signage so instead of ignoring our terrible, mistaken, and appalling past, we address it and finally educate the students on how the school came to be and why equality is still something that you need to fight for. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you, Ms. Mason. And uh, Marley Kay, McKay. Good morning, Chairman Mendelssohn and Honorable Council Members. I am Marlene Kay, a former student at Lafayette Elementary School. I we can barely hear you. If you could speak a little louder, and um, mind if you turn down the video unless you don't want anybody to see you. No, I, um, I had a problem with my video, but 
Um, good morning, Chairman Mendelson and Honorable Council Members. I'm Marlon McKay, a formal student at Lafayette Elementary School. I'm now a sixth grader at Alice Deal. I'm here today to request that the Lafayette Park and Recreation Center be renamed to include Black and George Pointer. The Founding Fathers built this country on land that wasn't theirs and on the backs of people that they owned. What happened to Captain George Pointer's family is just another example of this horrendous act. Captain Pointer and his family who were descended from enslavement worked very hard to secure the land, but the government didn't care and took it as their own to make way for a white neighborhood and school. His family's work and name were disrespected, and I think that we should rename the Lafayette Recreation Center and Park and his legacy that has been forgotten and ignored. As a former student at Lafayette Elementary School, I didn't always feel like minorities were well represented. This makes sense because of why the land was taken. Renaming the park and recreation center is not only the right thing to do to honor the history of the land, but it will in gesture and it also help instill a sense of pride and belonging to all minorities at the school and in the neighborhood. With many people feeling upset by the racial injustices going on currently, the small thing can be part of something bigger. It can give us hope that despite our past, we can move forward together and be better. For these reasons, I ask that you rename the land as the Lafayette Pointer Park and Lafayette Pointer Recreation Center. Thank you for your time and consideration. Uh, thank you, Ms. McKay. Um, it's not always easy uh, to testify. And uh, so I appreciate uh, your willingness to do that and Ms. Mason, actually everybody, but as we get older, maybe it's a little easier. Uh, I do wanna remind folks, several of you did not give us copies of your statements, Mr. Lankowski. And I think um, any additional material that the historic Chevy Chase DC could provide would be uh, helpful to us. We would include it in the record. And um, again, Ms. Green and Ms. Torrey copy of your statement. I have a question for um, Commissioner Speck. The, um, there's several of the witnesses have talked about uh, a signage. Do you have a sense of how much that would cost? I don't, uh, Chairman Middleson. I, I believe in the DPR testimony though, they estimate the, the amount. I think it's on the order of $18,000, something like that. Um, what, but I think DPR, of... DPR would be the, the appropriate um, agency, agency to estimate those costs. Okay. Um, do you have any sense of, that sounds like a lot of money. I, I really don't know whether that's the, the right amount or not, um, Chairman Middleton. I'm just relying on whatever DPR would say. Uh, they're obviously the one, ones who will have more information on that. Okay, well, I was, because I was going to suggest that maybe the ANC could pay for the signage, but 18000 is a little different. No. 1800 That's not um, within our budget. Well, let me suggest this, uh, that uh, uh, we, do, we do not, uh, when we do symbolic naming such as this, um, we do not have a fiscal impact of the bill, so we would not be requiring as part of the bill signage if there is a cost. Uh, but uh, I would urge that the ANC come back to us next spring when we have the budget and ask, remind us that uh, we ought to put money in the budget to pay for signage. I think that would be a way to get it done. Uh, we will certainly do that. Uh, with regard to the signage, we have been working with the National Park Service to create some signage for Chevy Chase Circle and the naming of the fountain there. And uh, I think that's really an important aspect of all of this is that we use this as an ed educational opportunity. And uh, signage will be critical, I think, to making this uh, effective. And certainly the ANC will come back to the council if we think that additional funding is necessary. Yes. Uh, well, yes, I wanna urge that because that will, uh, uh, we will forget and you will remember and you will remind us and it's not a lot of money, so we ought to be able to, to fund it. And I have to say that uh, I agree that signage is important. Uh, if, you're, if you're following this hearing, we have 10 bills. Uh, the bills are naming different things uh, and they're after people that uh, are largely unknown. 
who are largely unknown. And uh, sign-ins would help to explain, just as somebody takes the time here to testify uh, and explain why a name like Mr. Pointer or the Pointer family is important. Um, that's lost on most people and signage I think is important to, to make the point. Uh, just a moment, please. And my staff was reminding me that in this case, this is an official naming, not a symbolic naming. I do not have any other questions for any of you. I wanna thank each of you for your testimony. And uh, so you are excused and we're gonna turn now to Bill 23-680, Cecilia's Way Designation Act of 2020. Uh, Tina Boyd is the witness. I believe Ms. Boyd is coming into the witness room now. Mute. If you could turn on your video, that would be great. And um, yeah, yeah. Hi. Okay. If, if you could speak a little louder, that would be helpful. <clears throat> Chairman Middleson, uh, thank you for conducting this hearing regarding the symbolic name designation of Wilberger Way to Cecilia Way. Ms. Cecilia P. Scott was my mother. And in her honor, I seek the committee's support and ask for passage of B23-680. My mother was a pioneer and stalwart of the Shaw community. Ms. Cecilia Scott was one of the first African-American female business owners on Historic U Street. My mother purchased the stage door restaurant across from the Howard Theater in 1958. It was later named Cecilia's. Cecilia's was a night spot frequented by Washington's diverse political, artistic, social, and athletic committees, communities. Cecilia's provided excellent food and housing for the many entertainers performing at the historic Howard Theater and as an integral part and extension of the Howard Theater's great history. In addition to being the proprietor of Cecilia, my mother and Nadine Winters founded Hospitality House, a home for needy families. She worked tire tirelessly for her favorite project, which was school shoes that provided shoes and sweaters for the children in Shaw. Additionally, she established the first African-American woman-owned real estate development company in Washington, DC. Her commitment to the African-American business community was demonstrated by her hard work as the president of the local United Licensee Beverage Association when she organized a boycott against Anheuser-Busch who refused to hire African-American managers. For over 50 years, my mother was a savvy businesswoman who worked hard and remained committed to improving the Shaw community. I request this committee to honor her legacy by passing the Cecilia's Way Designation Act of 2020. I would like to thank the sponsors of Cecilia's Way legislation Councilmember Charles Allen and Councilmember Brianne Nato. I also wish to acknowledge the supporters of the bill, ANC 6E, Commissioners Michael Brown and Ethel Alex Pedro, the Howard Theater and Monumental Real Estate. On behalf of Cecilia Scott, Mr. Chairman, I thank you and the members of the committee for your time and consideration. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Ms. Boy. When did, um, when did the name change from stage door to Cecilia's? Um, like a year after she bought it, they changed it. So I would so, say in 1959. Okay, and then when did it close? The riots of 68. We moved, I, we, I lived, we lived above the bar as a matter of fact. <laughs> and uh, we moved after the riots. That's when the neighborhood kind of plummeted. And um, so we moved to, a, to another area in the city. And that's when it closed. Okay, um, interesting history. We have a copy of your statement, so I won't ask you for that because we already have it. Um, if we have other questions for you, we will, um, we will um, follow up with you. And um, we have in the record uh, statements from 
others in addition to yourself, uh, Chip Ellis, and um, the chair of ANC 6E, and Russell Hines. Yes. Yeah. Um, all of which is helpful. Um, thank you very much for your testimony. I have no other questions for you. Thank you. Uh, so you're excused. Uh, I am told that for Black Lives Matter Plaza, Bill 23-787, that Devon Jones could not be here. Uh, so we have no witnesses for Bill 23-787, which would uh, symbolically designate 16th Street between H and I think it's I or K as um, Black Lives Matter Plaza, something that's already been done through emergency and temporary legislation. And I should be accurate, uh, between 16th Street, between H Street and K Street. Uh, so then we will turn to uh, Bill 23-839, which is entitled Earl Wright Jr. Way Designation Act of 2020. One witness, Donna Wright Miller, you could be led into the witness room and uh, I can't yeah. hear her. I'm why, here. Why don't you begin? Good morning. Good morning. Um, uh, I would first like to thank Brandon Todd and his staff and all the neighbors and friends who took the time to assist our family in bringing this day of recognition for my father, Earl Wright Jr., to reality. I want to say a very special thank you to our neighbor, Betty Jean Roberts who initially suggested the idea of honoring my father by having the alley named in his honor. My father was born on February 14, 1928 in Lawrence, South Carolina to the late Reverend Earl Wright Sr. and Magnolia Wright. He passed away on April 11, 2017. My father migrated to Washington, D.C. over 60 years ago to pursue a career in painting and plastering, which was taught to him by his father. He retired from Howard University after 24 years of service in the physical facilities department. My father believed in spending quality time with his family and he made sure that his family was financially stable. He was very active in the Warfare community for over 50 years. He would assist neighbors and friends with various tasks and would tell you that he had no problem with helping you as long as you helped yourself. The Petworth neighbors knew my father was a jack of all trades and that he was capable of fixing almost anything. He was always available when called upon to assist when needed in, in the neighborhood. My dad took tremendous pride in keeping his neighborhood alley and streets clean for many years and would often be seen picking up trash in and around the neighborhood. He also enjoyed working in the neighborhood garden located behind our home where he would frequently cut the grass, prune the rose bushes and weeds while engaging in conversation with the neighbors. My father loved to fish, which was one of his favorite hobbies. On September 20th, 2000, Portland Malloy, featured by my dad in the Washington Post, thanks again to neighbor Betty Jean Roberts. The article spoke about how my father would catch fish and serve fish sandwiches and dinners to the less fortunate in the Petworth community. The article also mentioned how my dad mentioned young men in the community and how he taught them how to plaster and paint. The article further mentioned how my father would often share produce that he grew in the garden with the neighbors. My father was a beacon of light in the Petworth community and he shared his wisdom with those he encountered. Thank you for considering this matter and this moment in history for my father, Earl Wright Jr. Uh, thank you, Ms. Wright Miller. Uh, I don't think we have a copy of your statement. Could you provide that to us, please? Sure, thank you. And remind me again, his, your father's connection to 10th Street between Quincy and Randolph? Yes, it's between Quincy, Randolph, and 10th Street Northwest, the 3800 block of 10th Street Northwest, between Quincy, Randolph, and 10th Street Northwest. Yes. Um, his connection to that location? We live at 3828, so the alley is right behind our home which he cleaned and manicured the garden for, for years. So it's like three alleyway entrances here, but we're at 3828. Yes, okay, I understand. Um, okay, 
uh, we may have follow up with you with some questions, but please get us um, a copy of the um, of your statement. That would be helpful. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you for your testifying today. Thank you. And you're excused. Uh, so we'll turn now to uh, Bill 23-840, Ronald Ron Austin Memorial Park Designation Act. Uh, I don't believe we have any witnesses signed up for that. So then we will turn to the government witnesses. Uh, give me just a moment before I actually recognize or, or rather ask me to testify. But the two witnesses who should be led into the witness room are Ella Faulkner, who is Deputy Director of Administrative Services at the Department of Parks and Recreation, and Lee Goodall, who is Chief of Staff at the District Department of Transportation. So if they could both be led in, give me just a moment. I have a question for staff. Uh, thank you for your patience. Why don't we begin with Ms. Faulkner? Good morning, Chairperson Mendelson and members of the council. I am Ella Faulkner, the Deputy Director of Administrative Services and Interim Chief of Staff at the DC Department of Parks and Recreation. I am pleased to testify today on behalf of DPR regarding three bills that would change the names of our parks and facilities. Bill 23-508 would change the name of the Douglas Community Center, presently named for civil rights giant Frederick Douglas, who worked in as, as an abolitionist writer, editor, and orator to improve the lives of Black Americans to the Elaine M. Carter Community Center in honor of the late Mrs. Elaine M. Carter affectionately known as Mrs. E, a community leader and activist who devoted herself to the well-being of the Ward 8 community. Bill 23-629 would change the name of the Lafayette Park and Lafayette Recreation Center, presently named for Marquis de Lafayette, a military officer during the Revolutionary War 
who played an instrumental role in securing American victory at the siege of Yorktown to the Lafayette Pointer Park and the Lafayette Pointer Recreation Center in honor of George Pointer and his descendants who were central figures in the vibrant African-American community along Broad Branch Road in the 1800s and early 1900s. Bill 23-840 would designate the presently unnamed green space at the 6100 block of North Dakota Avenue Northwest between Quackenbow Street Northwest and 2nd Street Northwest as the Ronald Ron Austin Memorial Park after Ron Austin, also known as Mr. Constituent Services, who served as a Ward 4 ANC Commissioner and worked for multiple council members, Mayor Muriel Bowser, and as a DPR employee for over 24 years. Historically, DPR does not take a position on legislation to name or rename our parks and facilities. Rather, we defer to the mayor and the council of DC to make these decisions. As such, DPR takes a neutral position on the three bills before us today. However, DPR would like to call the council's attention to the need for a consistent approach to the naming of public assets that includes a clear set of criteria for evaluating prospective names, a robust community engagement, and gives agencies a role in the conversation. The recent naming of Alethea Tanner Park and Swamp Poodle Park serves as models for this objective and community-driven approach. Both parks were named using quantifiable broad-based community support. Over two-thirds of the more than 2,000 residents surveyed voted for the name Alethea Tanner Park in honor of Alethea Tanner. Miss Tanner purchased her freedom in 1810, as well as the freedom of at least 18 others, and went on to serve as a businesswoman, real estate owner, and supporter of educational and religious institutions for the free African-American community. Similarly, two-thirds of the 1,500 community members surveyed voted for the name Swamp Poodle, reflecting the language used by working class Irish immigrants used to describe the area in the mid 1800s. Across the nation and in the district, we have begun the hard work to carefully examine our namesake legacies, after whom we name our streets, schools and libraries, as well as our parks and recreation centers. I want to thank Mayor Muriel Bowser for her leadership in creating the District of Columbia Facilities and Commemorative Expressions, DC Faces, working group to evaluate the names of DC government owned facilities on which DPR's director Delano Hunter is proud to serve. In its recent report, the DC Faces Working Group speaks directly to the importance of ensuring the names we choose for our parks and recreation facilities are reflective of, of contemporary DC values. DPR's recreation and community centers are included in the report's number one priority group, learning, living, and leisure environments. DPR's parks, fields, and playgrounds are pair in the second highest priority group, public spaces. Understanding the core role of DPR parks and facilities in residents' lives, we at DPR wish to ensure intentionality and thought behind the naming and renaming of our public assets. Should the council and the mayor approve these three bills, DPR is equipped to implement the associated name changes. Bill 23-508 will require updated signage at the existing Douglas Recreation Center to reflect a new name, the Elaine M. Carter Community Center. We anticipate this cost about $13,000. Bill 23-619 will require updated signage for both Lafayette Park and the Lafayette Recreation Center to reflect the new name Lafayette Pointer and to include historical information. We anticipate this will cost $18,000. Lastly, Bill 
23-840 to create Ronald Ron Austin Memorial Park will require the installation of new Triangle Park signage, which will, we anticipate will cost $2,500. DPR estimates it will cost a total of $33,500 in total for all new signage associated with these three bills. DPR anticipates the ability to absorb these costs within its current budget and has no objections to the proposed designations. I thank you again for the opportunity to testify this morning before the Committee of the Whole. I am happy to address any questions you may have. Thank you, Ms. Faulkner. Uh, Mr. Goodall. Good morning, can I be heard? You can be heard. All right, I'll get started. Good morning, Chairman Mendelson, uh, members of the council, staff, and district residents. My name is Lee Goodall, and I'm the chief of staff at the District Department of Transportation, commonly referred to as DDOT. I'm here today to present testimony on behalf of Mayor Muriel Bowser and DDOT Director Jeff Marudian regarding seven bills, which are Bill 23-532, the Dr. Montague Cobb Way Designation Act of 2019, Bill 23533, the Lucy Diggs Slow Way Designation Act of 2019, Bill 23-538, the Elaine M. Carter Way Designation Act of 2019, Bill 23609, the Gail Cobb Way Designation Act of 2020, Bill 23-680, the Cecilia's Way Designation Act of 2020. Bill 237-787, the Black Lives Matter Plaza Designation Act of 2020. And Bill 23839, the Earl Wright Jr. Way Designation Act of 2020. The stated purpose of Bill 23-532 is to symbolically designate the 600 block of W Street Northwest in Ward 1 as Dr. Montague Cobb Way. For visualization purposes, I have attached to this testimony a copy of a DDOT generated map highlighting the designated street. In fiscal terms, the cost of each install sign for this designation is approximately $190. $65 for sign fabrication and $125 for sign installation. Sufficient signage requires two total signs, totaling $380. The stated purpose of Bill 23-533 is to symbolically designate the 2400 block of 4th Street Northwest in Ward 1 as Lucy Diggs Slow Way. For visualization purposes, I've attached to this testimony a copy of a DDOT generated map highlighting the designated street. Sufficient signage requires two total signs, totaling $380. The stated purpose of Bill 23-538 is to symbolically designate the Frederick Douglass Court Southeast in Square 5880 in Ward 8 as Elaine M. Carter Way. For visualization purposes, I have attached to this testimony a copy of a DDOT generated map highlighting the designated street. Sufficient signage requires one total sign, totaling $190. The stated purpose of Bill 23-609 is to symbolically designate the 300 block of 14th place Northeast in Ward 6 as Gail Cobb Way. For visualization purposes, I have attached to this testimony a copy of a DDOT generated map highlighting the designated street. Sufficient signage requires two total signs, totaling $380. The stated purpose of Bill 23-680 is to symbolically designate Wiltberger Street Northwest between S Street Northwest and T Street Northwest on the border of Wards 1 and 6 as Cecilia's Way. For visualization purposes, I've attached to this testimony a copy of a DDOT generated map highlighting the designated street. Sufficient signage requires one total sign, totaling $190. The stated purpose of Bill 
is to symbolically designate the 3800 block of 10th Street Northwest between Quincy and Randolph Streets in Ward 4 as Earl Wright Jr. Way. For visualization purposes, I've attached to this testimony a copy of a DDOT generated map highlighting the designated street. Sufficient signage requires two total signs, totaling $380. Sufficient signage requires 11 total signs, totaling $2,090 for the aforementioned designations. DDOT is able to absorb the cost of these signs within its current budget and does not foresee any operational impact these designations would have on the district's transportation network. The stated purpose of Bill 23-787 is to symbolically designate 16th Street Northwest between H Street Northwest and K Street Northwest in War II as Black Lives Matter Plaza. For visualization purposes, I have attached to this testimony a copy of a DDOT generated map highlighting the designated street. Signs have already been installed pursuant to emergency and temporary legislation that effectuated this symbolic designation. On behalf of Mayor Muriel Bowser, I want to take a moment to reflect on this special significance of this designation. The Black Lives Matter movement has been at the forefront of advocating for racial justice, including organizing peaceful protests, rallies, and other actions in response to the deaths of Eric Gardner, Michael Brown, Tamir Rice, Freddie Gray, Sandra Bland, Alton Sterling, Philando Castile, and other Black men and women at the hands of the police. In 2020, the deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and several other Black men and women sparked new outrage, leading to a wave of peaceful protests across the country against racism and police brutality. In response to these protests in the district and across the country, and in recognition of the work that still needs to be done to ensure that Black lives do matter, Mayor Muriel Bowser stated publicly on June 5th, 2020, that the portion of 16th Street Northwest between 8th Street Northwest and K Street Northwest should be designated as Black Lives Matter Plaza. This designation reaffirms the value of the lives and legacy of the district's Black community and reaffirms our commitment to racial justice and equity. Therefore, the administration has no objection to these designations and DDOT stands ready to assist the council and other stakeholders with any ceremonial unveiling activities that may materialize as a result of these bills being passed. This concludes my testimony Thank you all for allowing me the opportunity to testify before you today. I'm available to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you, Mr. Goodall, and thank you, Ms. Faulkner. I do have a few questions for you. Um, and I'm a little... Um, let me see, I've got paper all over the place here. That's the problem with 10 bills at once. Um, Ms. Faulkner, uh, we, uh, the law requires that we have plats for official names. And uh, what we received from you or DPER was uh, historical plats, not new ones. Can you work with the surveyor's office to get us uh, plats? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. We'll work on those. Thank you. Uh, mm -hmm. And Mr. Goodall, DDOT takes the position that the administration has no objection to these designations. Ms. Faulkner, your testimony says that the department is neutral. Uh, is that on behalf of the department or on behalf of the administration? So that is beyond, on behalf of the department. Um, we want to have a more consistent and inclusive approach to renaming. We want to include our um, our community members because we've seen that there is great benefit in the two recent parks that we've recently um, opened, uh, which is Alethea Tanner Park as well as Swamp Poodle. We want to ensure that there is a consistent approach to, um, to renaming. Well, it does the, has the department adopted uh, so, uh, written procedures or process? We are actually working on that currently. And when do you think that will be done? 
Uh, well, you know, it's going to take some time for us to all come together and because also we do want to include our sister agencies office of planning in this conversation as well. Um, so we are looking to start this process as soon as we can um, and get something out um, probably within the next few months. Um, why would you include the office of planning? Not that I have anything against them. <laughs> no, but they, when it comes to your assets, they're your assets, not another agency's assets. So why would you include them? So Office of Planning in the, is, a, is a great partner with us. Um, we are actually developing our agency master plan along with them, which is, um, which is close to the, to the comprehensive plan. And as well, they have um, the Historic Preservation Office, uh, which we rely heavily on when it comes to um, historic places, which a lot of our parks are historic. And so we, um, we actually rely on them uh, for um, assistance when it comes to uh, specific locations. So we would include them for being just consistent with the comprehensive plan as well. Well, I could see consulting with them, but if it slows down your process, you know that the DCPS has developed a process for naming. Mm, okay. Do you know that? I did not know that, and we will actually reach out to them to uh, get their feedback on their process. Uh, please, because um, they went through that process for the naming, the renaming of Orr Elementary School to Boone Elementary School, and then we pushed them to follow that process. They were a little slow starting it, but to follow their own process with regard to the renaming of Aton School to Lorraine Whitlock, which is a conversation we're marking up next week. And we have a hearing on a bill following this hearing on um, the um, proposals to rename Woodrow Wilson High School and urging that uh, DCPS follow its process so they have a process. Um, I think that would be helpful. I don't know that we will wait with regard to these bills, but um, I think that would be helpful going forward to have a, um, a process. Uh, okay, thank you. I have several questions, uh, several more questions. Um, typically we name only one thing, whether we're talking about a street or a building or a park, after a person. Uh, we have one of the bills before us would name both the rec center, the Lafayette Recreation Center, as well as the um, park. Does DPR consider that that's one name for the whole complex or that that's two names? So normally we would name it as one which is the Lafayette Pointer Recreation Center, and it will include the park space as well. So it should just be one. And by naming the center, it includes? The park space. I had a question, uh, or maybe two, for Mr. Goodall. The, um, in your testimony, there were two locations where you said only one sign was needed. Cecilia's Way? That's correct. Uh, which you said needs only one sign? I'm confused here. Um, and let me see if I can find the flag. Give me a first second. Okay. 
Cecilia's way would name Wilberger, symbolically name Wilberger between S and T. That's correct. Why would that be only one sign? Why not two? One at T and one at S? Uh, it's a one-way street, so we typically um, locate the sign at the entrance of that roadway. Can I ask you to rethink that? My guess is that I'm not sure which way is the one way, but um, my guess is that there's a street sign for Wilberger at both ends of that. Uh, that is no, I, we can, I can absolutely look at that again, but we do typically, if it's a, a, a one way street, we would place it at the entrance of that street for, for that direction. Um, I would have to, I would, I'm happy to look at the uh, intersection of the, uh, of the other end to see if there's an, a, a street sign there. If there's a street sign there, um, official, official street sign there, we can also put the ceremonial street sign at that location as well. My recollection is that it runs one way from S to T. That's correct. Uh, that would be uh, north. So you would uh, put the sign at S Street, but for folks who are on T Street or even on Florida, they would not have a clue what that street is called. You wouldn't have Wilberger there as well. Uh, that I, I'm happy to look. I'll, I'll have my team look at that intersection. Um, if there is a, or should be, there may not be currently today for one reason or another, but if there is a, um, if there's not a street sign at that intersection, we can look at installing one officially for the name of Wiltberger. And then we can also place a, cerem a ceremonial sign at that intersection as well. Okay. And then I have the same question for Elaine Carter way. Um, as I recall, that's a U shaped Douglas Court is U-shaped? Yes. So why would you only have one sign? One way again? Uh, it would be wherever we place the official naming of the road sign, a roadway, um, it would be the same case. It would be the same situation. But I think that they, they use to the main street. So it, there's only one sign at that roadway for that, for that direction. Okay, I want to give you a hard time about it, but I'm not really upset. But uh, when I'm driving along and I get to an intersection, I don't care whether it's one way or two way or even many different ways, I still want to see a sign that tells me what intersection I'm at. Chairman, I'm, ha I'm happy to have the team look at it and make the change if necessary. Okay, um, thank you. And then I believe I had one last question, and that was for Ms. Faulkner again. I think interpretive signage is important in some instances, uh, and I'm thinking in particular the proposed Lafayette Pointer uh, complex. Um, why does it cost $13,000 for signage at a rec center, and then why would it cost $5,000 more for historical information. It, yeah. Well, the 13,000 sounds way too high, unless you're talking about a bronze plaque. <laughs> so, it's, so if we're speaking about the Lafayette Pointer Recreation Center, it's actually, um, I believe 18,000 is what we estimated. And that, and that estimation came from DGS. Um, this cost includes the signage for the building, it's the building marquee signs, as well as the physical park signs. Uh, those are large green signs that we have in our parks. Um, and then also with the, um, with the informational sign, the historic information sign, that has to go to a specific vendor um, that um, is, is produced and most likely it will be either bronze or it will be acrylic. So um, that 18,000 is for all three of those particular signage as well as the installation um, of those signs. Well, the way I came up with my figures was you said to rename Douglas Recreation Center would cost 13,000. So I'm assuming that to rename Lafayette Recreation Center has a similar cost. 
-hmm. Then Lafayette would have historical information, so that would be why it's 18,000. That's how I came up with the additional five. Mm -hmm. Yes. 13,000 sounds awfully high. DGS yeah. charges you and then you pay. <laughs> That's uh, DGS's estimates. Um, I think you should push back. For the um, historical signage, that would include text. How would you go about getting the text? So we actually do work with the Historic Preservation Office. Um, they will help us to produce the research and the information that's needed for the signage. Then we will work with the family members. We're going to work with the community members as well as the um, council um, on the on the actual language and then it's approved as a final um, submission and then it gets produced by the signage vendor. Okay, I think that sounds good and that will cost $5,000, but the basic green signs will cost 13,000. So the park signage, which is the green signs, they normally run about $3,000. Uh, the park sign, uh, and I should say that because that Lafayette Park is large, there will probably about there'll probably be about two different signage at at either entrance of that park, and then the additional um, funding goes to signage for the recreation center, where there'll be a new name on that facility on that building. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, uh, from, for our purposes, you've said that the cost can be absorbed, but I do think it's worth your um, pushing back on what the costs are. And I think the process you're outlining for the text sounds good. Um, so that there's some consultation and I do think that that um, text is important. Mm -hmm. uh, give me just a second here. I have a question I think about um, Wiltberger, give me a sec. Uh, thank you, Ms. Faulkner. I don't think I have another question for you on that. Um, my staff gave me a photo of um, the intersection of Wilberger and Estry. Uh, Wilberger runs southbound, so it runs it runs from T to S, because I'm looking at a do not enter sign at yeah. F. And there's also a street sign there for Wilberger. Mr. Chairman Mendelson, I'm, I'm also looking at the same information my team uh, provided me as well. So I do see the, um, as you were referring, I will amend what I said earlier. There is an official ro uh, roadway sign for Wiltberger um, at the intersection of T. So we'll place a ceremonial sign there. And then at the intersection of Wiltberger and S Street, the roadway sign is on the uh, south side of the uh, S Street. So it's not as obvious, but um, there is an official sign there uh, indicating that that is Wiltberger Street um, Northwest, and we can also place an official uh, ceremonial, uh, I should say a ceremonial sign at that location. So um, that would mean uh, we would add an additional $190 to that portion of the uh, designation. Okay. Um, I think that sounds good or appropriate. And then the other, which was, uh... Douglas, you'll look at that, Douglas Court, being renamed, or rather symbolically named uh, after Lane Carter. That's correct. And I'm, I'm looking to pull it up right now, and we will do the same thing. Okay. Yes, I'm, I'm looking at it right now, and um, we'll have to install an additional official sign to, to denote it, but we'll do the ceremonial as well so that it mirrors what we're doing at Wilberger. Sorry for the confusion. Oh, uh, no, that's okay. Um, if I hadn't asked a question, you wouldn't be confused. So I apologize for the confusion. Uh, thank you, each of you, for your testimony. Uh, Ms. Um, 
Faulkner, you'll get back with regard to the plaque, plaques. Will do. And uh, if we have additional questions, we'll be in touch. Thank, Thank you. you. That's going to conclude this hearing. Uh, again, this has been a hearing on 10 bills that would name officially or symbolically various streets or alleys or recreation centers or buildings. And the record in this matter will be open for two weeks for uh, submissions that I've requested as well as uh, if anybody else wishes to submit statements. So the record will close at 5 p.m. on September 29th. The time is now 11 o'clock in the morning and this hearing is adjourned.